Thank you. Thank you so much for accepting our presentation. I'd ask some help with the with the PowerPoint, maybe. Um, I was saying that our presentation proposes an interpretation of dance and theater as a space in which the gazes, practices, and artistic and political theories circulating in Italy and Spain in the 1920s and 30s came to intersect. And a person who acted as both a point of convergence and the means of dissemination for this perspective was the Italian Anton Giulio Bragaglia. You see the, the guy over there. And Bragaglia was a theater director and a film director as well. And he was a very multifaceted figure and, and an energetic theorist of what he called the photodynamismo, this technique to catch the movement through, through photos, through pictures. And he was a theorist of scenography and direction more in general. But in this historical period, Bragaglia was also the fascist intellectual most focused on dance in all of Italy. Not only was dance the object of Bragaglia's torrential journalistic and scientific writing, but he also organized the actual dance seasons at the Teatro Sperimentale degli Indipendenti. This theater, which he founded and directed in the 1920s, with occasional support from the fascist state, showcased some of the leading names of choreographic experimentation in these years, including Rudolf Laban School and Mel Wigman, but the theater launched as well other new dancers, such as the Russian-born Giaruskaya, who acted very consistently in Italy. Bragaglia traveled at length in Spain in 1930 and held numerous conferences here. One of these conferences was, or, was organized at the Residencia de Estudiantes here in Madrid and held the title El Nuevo Teatro Tecnico, in which Bragaglia discusses many of the topics he had addressed in his books. Um, our presentation does sets off from uh, Bragaglia's trip in Spain and tries to push you to distinct yet intertwined direction. Raquel will address how Spanish observers perceived Bragaglia on an artistic and political level, as well as his possible influences on the Spanish theater and dance, especially after, of course, his trip in Spain. I will instead try to map how Spanish dances appeared in Bragaglia's critical and theoretical discourse before and after his direct encounter with Spain. In Bragaglia's overall theorizing of dance, Spanish dance occupies a place that is more revealing than extensive. In fact, his considerations on Spanish dance embody his theories on dance in general. And at the same time, we can see how this thought on dance changes over time and the shifts um, which are connected to the national and international sociopolitical context. To grasp the significance of this change, I focus on two volumes, Scultura Vivente from 1928 and La Bella Danzante from 1936. The second one is the last book that Bragaglia dedicates both to theatrical and folkloric dance, while in the future it will be much more focused just on folkloric dance. In Scultura Vivente, the first one, the chapter titled Spanish Dances, Danza Espanole, is of course totally uh, dedicated to Spain. This chapter is the slightly modified version of an article published in March 1925 on the theatrical journal Comedia, a journal, by the way, very well known in Spain. The chapter, the, this one, the, okay, okay. The chapter of Spanish dances reflects on so-called traditional forms of Spanish dance that were actually conceived 
specifically for the theater. So the, the folkloric dance that were not folkloric in reality. And among this set of artistic practices, Bragaglia distinguishes between Spanish dances presenting a sort of empty and mummified revival of folkloric elements and others like uh, the dances by Nereida or Antonia Mercela Argentina that he felt were characterized by, I quote, sincerity, deriving from the fusion of traditional elements with a blatantly modernist sensibility and style. This contrast between codified and sincere dance illustrates a dichotomy that characterizes all of Bragaglia's discourse on dance in this period. This formulaic revival of folklore in the form of a code disconnected from the profound inner needs of the artist, but also as a superficial and eroticized display of female beauty can be compared to academic ballet in Bragaglia view, of course. And Bragaglia was forcefully critical of academic dance in the decades under consideration, labeling it a manifestation of virtuosity for its own sake and wholly lacking in soul. In contrast, a dancer like Nereida seemed to perform the miracle of merging stylistic refinement with the instinctive and characteristic fire of the Spanish soul giving rise to an intense dramatic tension between passion and control. Furthermore, when dance is authentic, it functions as a site for manifesting not only the individuality of the artist, but also, in Bragaglia's word, the blood of the people from which it flows. He uses the word sangue in Italian. In a mixture of rampant racism, nationalism, and personal erudition, Bragaglia uses the term blood as a physical site when the so where the soul of a people is rooted. In his view, since a people's soul is founded in biology, it has a, a transhistorical nature while also surfacing systematically in history. So it is transhistorical and historical at the same time. In the case of Spain, for example, Bragaglia saw the typical character of the Spanish as comprising pride, haughtiness, grandiose airs, and coarseness. And indeed, according to him, all these elements were clearly historically expressed in the Spanish domination of Italy that took place between the 16th and 18th century. Due to its simultaneously physical, spiritual, and historical character, he believed that the soul of a people that emerges in dance bears the traces of its own history. And these traces in turn have the power to shape the movements of dance. Bragaglia's perception of Spain, of Spanish dance, changed decisively after his trip in 1930. This trip also coincided with a period in which his own engagement with dance was shifting from direct involvement in organizing and promoting performances to treating dance just as a topic of theoretical discussion. Nevertheless, it was not long before he once again began pointing out and assessing the sincerity and supposed fire of Spanish dances. The traces of this thinking can be found in La Bella Danzante, particularly the chapters Il Baile Flamenco and Danze Aragonesi. In these cases, as well, the chapters are modified republications of articles that had already appeared in various journals since 1932. Here an example. As Bragaglia's personal archive also show, these texts were apparently travel chronicles in which he recounts his experiences of viewing dance performances. It is important to note that this shows took place outside theater and were performed by local non-professional dancers. At least this is what he said. The dance's folk origins would certainly have made them extremely interesting to a fascist era Italian and to a fascist as such as Bragaglia. In this period, valorizing Italy's of traditional songs and dances 
was a top priority, not only for the main governmental institutions dedicated to culture, but also among dense intellectuals, whether modernists such as Bragaglia or classical academic adherents. Furthermore, Bragaglia's gaze, is, uh, Bragaglia's gaze I'm sorry, had its own specificities. In La Bella Danzante, he focused mainly on two types of dance, flamenco and the hot aragonesa. He saw these dances as the expression of two opposing temperaments, an oriental one stemming from Arab traditions for flamenco and the Western one implicitly framed as even more similar to Italian sensibility for the Jota. To support this thesis, Bragaglia proposes a sort of psychophysical analysis of the movement. He views flamenco, the expression of a sweet and solitary anguish, as based on concentric, contained motion that transforms the body into a sort of column from which expressive arms extend. He contrasts the implosive character of flamenco to the explosive one of the jota, viewing this as a Western dance by virtue of its opening outwards into space, and above all, its longing to take flight. It bears noting that in La Bella Danzante, Bragaglia had addressed the theme of flight as a distinctive trait of European dance and Italian forms in particular, even asserting a link between the dance of Maria Taglioni and the dance theorized by Filippo Tommaso Marinetti and the Futurists. Even as Bragaglia's perspectives on Spanish dance changed, however, he did hold fast at least one recurring image. The above mentioned idea of Spanish dance being animated by fire. Although Spain was perceived as similar to Italy by virtue of its being a Latin and Mediterranean country and sharing the same talent for improvisational flair in life and art, Spain was also seen as partly dissimilar and more southern, I would say. Perhaps precisely because of this fire implicitly associated with the idea of heat and, of course, light. Indeed, it was specifically the idea of light that gave rise to one of the main areas in which Bragaglia's thought may have influenced the Spanish theater and the Spanish scene in general. Time limits prevent me from describing this key aspect of Bragaglia's scenography theory in detail, but in brief, he held that colored light had the power to render the invisible visible granting scenic substance to the inner world of human beings and distorting phenomenal reality through the luminous forms of presence that constitute the very soul of the scene, that is, its psychological, emotional, and spiritual substance. I want now to leave the floor to Raquel by quoting a, a short passage from a typewritten document preserved in the Bragaglia archive. Here, he describes a Spanish landscape he is viewing from above in a, in a sort of airborne sea plane. He's traveling on plane. Looking down, he is reminded of the painting by El Greco. I quote and translate in Italian, of course, in English, of course. I quote, El Greco illuminated the scene with one lantern on the right and another one on the left, each a different color. His figures are always half red and half blue, half sepia and half yellow, and annulled by artificial lighting, elongated by the feathery touch of the flame and seen as if reflected in a crooked mirror." End quote. The El Greco light Bragaglia describes here is clearly a theatrical light that stretches and distorts what it illuminates, becoming like dance the body of the soul. Thank you very much. Tomo el relevo de Julia. Voy a continuar en inglés. Voy a ir más despacio. Hablo mucho peor que ella, pero voy a intentarlo para que sigan sintonía esta esta ponencia. Gracias, Julia. Vale. 
As Julia has said before, Anton Julio Bragaglia travels to Spain in 1930 and also gave a lecture at the Residencia de Estudiantes in Madrid. Bragaglia presented El Nuevo Teatro Técnico, accompanied by one of the most important Spanish theater uh, men, Cipriano Rivas Cherif. Uh, as Salina Navas has pointed out, we know that Bragaglia exposed part of his, of his last theater writings, mostly from his book Teatro Revolucione, dedicated to Mussolini, as you can see on the screen. But not, I, say, I, I must say that it's not the only book, but this is the main part. This visit of Bragaglia uh, took place as a part of the fascist soft power and can also be framed within the diplomatic exchange established between the dictatorship of Primo de Rivera in Spain during the 1923 and 1930 and the Mussolini's regime. Bragaglia's visit had a great impact on the Spanish press uh, and in general, uh, journalists portray Bragaglia as a duchess man and as an scenic agitator. The press also served us as an ideological barometer of Madrid's cultural atmosphere. From an ideological point of view, apparently we discovered two positions that are aligned with the studies of the period that, that pointed a growing political division between anti-fascists and philo-fascists. For example, from a more left-wing newspapers, uh, journalists were against fascism and made it clear, as you can read on the screen. And on the opposite side, we find Jiménez Caballero uh, and his cultural newspaper La Gaceta Literaria, Jiménez Caballero had promoted Bragaglia's work in this, in this newspaper, and he was also very, a very well-known philo-fascist. In fact, in 1935, he would be introduced to Mussolini by Bragaglia. But that's another story. In Madrid, he put the Italian also as the guest of honor of a dinner organized by him. This dinner is important because it brought together intellectuals, politicians, and artists from all spectrums. Among the guests, we find Ramiro de Ledesma Ramos, a key figure of Spanish fascism, but we can also find Rodolfo Halter, the Francoism, or artists like Joan Miró, Eugenio Dos, an intellectual, or the bullfighter Ignacio Sánchez Mejías. Uh, we know also that Bragaglia saw the dancer Laura de Santelmo at the Colmao Los Gabrieles, and in this occasion he was accompanied by Rivas Cherif, another time, and Eduardo Garte. The last one will create one of the most famous and fresh theater companies during La República, La Barraca, co founded with Federico García Lorca. Uh, we can say that all these events place Bragaglia very close to the intellectuals and in particular to some of the main Spanish scene renovators. Related to this, we can move on to the aesthetic part. Uh, Bragaglia arrived in Spain, in Spain also in the middle of a discussion on re theatralization. And even if there was a group of people that considered that it was necessary to renew the theater in a way similar to that proposed by Bragaglia, that is, in a more visual and, and, and spectacular way, most still defended the importance of the text above all else. Press also indicates that Bragaglia was well known in Spain by his books. A Spanish journalists refer to all this, you can see projected on the screen. And dance was also important in this way because he was valued as the discoverer of Ruskaya and one of the main books quote, quoted by critics were, for example, Escultura Vivente. Um, be, beyond this immediate impact, we wondered about the significance of Bragaglia's uh, incursion to, into Spain, not so much on an ideological level, since we know that he returned during the 50s, that is, during the Franco's dictatorship, but on an aesthetic one related to this theatrical renovation, which finally took place during the years of the Republic. 
la República, la Segunda República. To think about the possible reflections uh, produced by this encounter, we would like to consider two other things. First, has to do with the visual dimension of the conference. Bragalia projected uh, 70 slides to accompany his speech, and some of them, as you can see, were published also in newspapers as ABC. The second has to do with the idea of La Residencia as a focus for that renovation. And finally, uh, we would like to do it through dance. Federico García Lorca, Ignacio Sánchez Mejías, and Encarnacio López Jurbe de Argentinita created the Compañía de Bailes Españoles in 1933. They were all, I think, marked with an arrow over their heads, and they were also very close to La Residencia. This company became very famous for their version of Manuel de Falla, El Amor Brujo, a premiere in Cádiz and Madrid in 1933, only three years after Bragalla's visit. As most of you know, the ballet had been premiered in Paris in 1925 by Antonia Mercer, Argentina. This time, uh, the, produ the production changed a lot, and in fact, it was not, all, not very well received by all the, the critics. The main difference uh, had to do with the introduction of three elderly gypsy dancers, La Malena, La Fernanda, and y La Macarrona. I think they are recognizable on the photos. Another one was the set designed by the painter Manuel Fontanals. As you can appreciate, uh, the set shows a tendency to abstraction and also had an air with some Bragalia's scenographies, like the ones I project before, even if they were not very clear on that image. Based on the descriptions of the performances, sets were composed by a blue cyclorama and columns covered with a red silk. Then color lights were projected over them uh, on a physical, on a psychodramatical uh, way. As far as we have, have been able to know, that was not, not very common in Spanish stages. And, oh, sorry. One of Rogalia's contributions to the stage has been the Lanterna Solare, the Sun Lantern. Uh, and what, what, what was this? This was a projection system composed by color, lights, plates, on a base that could rotate. This was this 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 lantern was known in Spain even before the arrival of Ragalia. The painter Enrique Estevez included the system on his, his influential book Nuevo Scenario, published in 1928. Nevertheless, Ragalia's conception of light was more than just technical. It also had a psychological component and a metaphysical part, as Julia has said. We could even say an esoteric uh, side and why I am saying this. I propose this because he associated light also with the transmission of rhythm and time. Rhythm and time in the context of 20th century, century dance is often linked to an occult twist and this is due to the influence of esoteric movements such as theosophy in the theories of Rudolf Steiner and dance movements as German expressionism. These, by the way, as Julia explained also, were of interest to Bragalia. Dance was revealed as a form, uh, according to these movements, dance was revealed as a form of bodily expression capable of connecting with a higher reality and as a language that allowed to connect with ancestors. Steiner's definition of rhythm is very similar to the one Bragalia used in another work published later, Evolucione del Mimo. I can't go into this, so I will rescue this esoteric idea of like thinking about El Amor Brujo, a ballet with a magical esoteric plot in which we also know that light was used by this company with a psychological purpose, as you could read before. In addition, the ballet was composed by dancers that made refer refer reference to spirits. And the spirits, spirits and electricity were very much linked at, the, at that time through spiritualist and occult, occultist movements. 
a Simone Bile quote that was based on, on, on energy. So light, thought, and spirit were practically the same thing also on the stage, according to dance and art historians as Pascal Rousseau, for example. I would like to add one more idea to make this connection even closer, Federico García Lorca's own conception of flamenco. This was explained at a conference in, 19, in the 1930s, but it can be traced back to 1922 during the celebration of the Cante Hondo contest, the famous Cante Hondo contest in Granada. Falla has also participated in this contest uh, with sought to purify, to, to purify flamenco through the idea of lo hondo. Okay, lo hondo is a very complex uh, concept, but is, it referred to the root, the tradition, and went back to an ancestral past. When distinguishing between flamenco and hondo, Marcia Lorca said that the first has an spiritual color while the latter has a local, a local one. Um, that is, the former was more transcendent than, than, than the latter, uh, more anecdotal. And to achieve this effect on the stage, Bragaglia also has a formula uh, published on Teatro Revolucione, uh, and also uh, um, presented in this conference. Uh, to conclude, I want to, to invoke the, the, the concept diffraction. Diffraction is, uh, about, uh, through this uh, painting, diffraction in physics, in physics defines the deviation that the same wave undergoes before an obstacle. Diffraction was used by Donna Haraway and Karen Barat to lead that nothing is static, nor is it inherently, inherently separable. Under this electric but solar light, we can think about diffraction to open new paths that start from a common line around ideas such as modernity or tradition, particularly on the stage, or color and warmth associated with Spanish identity. In the case of Spain, this also allows to us to diffract some static thoughts such as the existence of two generation of 27, or to understand an identity al calor of a more Mediterranean and esoteric light links to dance. Thank you.